All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. We had a great discussion earlier and we're gonna continue that legacy moving on into the afternoon. We're gonna continue on with infection prevention and control and biosecurity and Dr. Paul Plummer is our moderator today. But first, to let you know what's happened. Hospitals continue to be at max capacity as the public health infrastructure is overburdened with the ongoing influenza pandemic, and healthcare workers are observing a breakdown in infection prevention and control strategies. Public health experts are concerned that the rate of secondary bacterial infections will dramatically increase in the coming weeks, many of which they fear will be resistant to the currently available treatments. Additionally, federal agencies have released a joint statement highlighting the impact this pandemic has had on the swine production workforce. Farms are seeing a general decline in animal husbandry practices and swine health due to a workforce that has been depleted by human illness from the pandemic. With fewer workers to care for the animals, pork producers are now unable to effectively identify and treat sick pigs as infections continue to spread. Well, with that update, we'll get back into our fourth and final module, and I'm excited to tee up this uh, opportunity to talk about infection prevention and control, as well as biosecurity. I think over the last couple of, uh, last day and a half, the last three modules, uh, several times, multiple times, we've had some discussion around how the pandemic, what we've learned through the pandemic, uh, impacting our workforce, fatigue and shortages, and, and then severely challenging our ability to maintain effective IPC as well as biosecurity in some cases. So in this module, we're going to explore how we can better prepare for the mock scenario that we've been discussing for the last day and a half. In particular, we're interested in looking at how do we prepare in advance for addressing the workforce impacts that might mitigate and create negative impacts on our antimicrobial resistance or other health outcomes on both the human and the animal side. In addition, in the mock scenario, we have the potential for bi-directional transfer or movement of disease between humans and animals. And so we wanna explore what we may need to do to prep for such a situation. We have a very esteemed panel of speakers uh, for, this, uh, for this module. So I will quickly introduce each of them very quickly and then we will uh, jump into their presentations. So first we have Dr. Terry Rabeman from the Institute of Biosecurity in St. Louis University. Second, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Tiffany Lee from the Clemens Food Group. Third, Dr. Jeff Bender from the University of Minnesota will speak on the agricultural workforce. Fourth, Dr. Lillian Abo from Jackson Health System will speak on the frontline perspective. And last but not least, a frequent flyer on the PACARB panels. <laughs> <laughs> back, Dr. Arjun Srinivasan, who hopefully we have his right pan, uh, right slides teed up today. And so that's what happens when you speak multiple times, Arjun. We, we... So with that, we will dive uh, straight into the presentation from Dr. Terry Redman. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me here today to talk about infection prevention and control. Next slide, please. So a scenario involving an influenza pandemic with secondary infections caused by an antibiotic resistant organism is going to create great challenges for healthcare facilities as well as public health due to the combination of having a medical surge plus that risk of disease spread. So it's going to be critical to involve infection preventionists or IPs in development of, of the evidence-based protocols at the local, regional, and national levels. Now, in the past, IPs have not always been involved in protocol development during pandemics. So, for instance, during H1N1 in 2009, many IPs reported to have not been involved in helping to shape policy for their facilities. During the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, or APIC, conducted focus groups with IPs and asked what challenges they were facing. Many IPs reported they were excluded from COVID protocol development. Subsequently, they believe their facility protocols were not evidence-based and the healthcare staff with whom they were working felt unsafe. And there was a lot of confusion and distrust about the pandemic protocols. They also reported that they were seeing a consistent lack of coordination of infection prevention and mitigation strategies across regions. Now in follow-up focus groups that were conducted in 20 of 21, many more IPs reported they were now involved in developing protocols, which is good news. 
but there needs to be strong support at the federal level to have IPs involved in pandemic planning and response, and this includes in all healthcare settings. Long-term care settings in particular have struggled with finding and maintaining trained IPs even during non-pandemic times. And yet, of course, we know that they have one of the most vulnerable populations. So there needs to be some federal investment in supporting IP positions across all healthcare settings. Next slide, please. During a pandemic involving influenza and secondary AMRs, IPs are going to play a vital role in response, just as they have during the COVID-19 pandemic. IP's workloads will increase dramatically due to that pandemic, and we need to have more individuals that have that expertise to help with the response. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the IP field is currently facing major challenges. There is currently and has been a national shortage of IPs, just as the need for IP positions has grown. Many IPs left the field during the pandemic. Some chose to retire early, some elected to move to a different position within healthcare, and even some new IPs chose to leave due to burnout and very stressful and overwhelming workloads of being an IP during pandemic response. A study with APIC members found that 25% of all healthcare facilities had open IP positions in 2019, even before the pandemic hit, and that number only rose during the pandemic. More than half of all long-term care facilities reported that they had an IP leave in the last two years, and about 40% of IPs across the nation will be retiring in the next 10 years. IP leaders across the United States have reported they are unable to find interested or qualified staff to work as IPs, and even if they're able to hire someone who is qualified, their existing IPs are too busy and overworked to train the new staff. Most individuals entering the IP field come from a background of nursing, microbiology, or they have a master's of public health. But there is currently no existing academic pathway into infection prevention, which means that there's a relatively long orientation and training period when someone does join the field. We need to have investment at the federal level for incentives for universities to create an academic pathway into infection prevention and control or IPC, and there needs to be incentives for individuals to join and stay in the field. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, IP's workloads are going to increase dramatically during this type of an event. Pandemic response is going to be added to their already heavy workload which means that some work will be dropped unless additional IPs are hired or other staff are found to fill some of those tasks. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many IPs reported that their regular IP duties had to be eliminated in order for them to respond to the pandemic, but they did not believe that they did this in a strategic way. For instance, many IPs reported in a research study that was conducted that their routine surveillance had to be paused for months while they responded to the pandemic. In order to assist with this, there needs to be a strategic approach to prioritize IP workloads during pandemics and other types of disasters. APIC did develop a tool to aid in this response. It's called the IPC Acuity Scale. It's designed to help infection preventionists and healthcare leaders have a collaborative decision about which IP duties will be maintained by the IP because they have that specialized expertise. Which tasks can be delegated to other healthcare staff and which activities might be able to be dropped safely on a temporary basis. So for example, as we discussed yesterday, surveillance is one of the most critical activities during a pandemic involving an AMR, and that really needs to be done by a qualified or trained infection preventionist to ensure that we have accurate data that is collected and reported. So it would be really critical that surveillance be prioritized for the infection preventionist, while less critical tasks could be delegated or stopped temporarily. Next slide, please. We can anticipate in this kind of a pandemic that personal protective equipment or PPE is going to be limited, just as we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic and past pandemics as well. A survey conducted in the first months of the pandemic before we actually had the first wave of patients in the U.S. found that most U.S. healthcare systems were already almost out of respirators, masks, and other types of PPE. The president enacted the Defense Production Act in spring of 2020 to direct resources towards development of PPE for healthcare, which greatly helped, but it did not eliminate all the PPE shortages that we experienced. It's very likely that the Defense Production Act is going to be needed to be enacted again, or other types of federal assistance are going to be needed to address the supply chain challenges and PPE shortages that we can anticipate are going to occur. 
One option is to invest now in the development and research of reusable respiratory protection or universal respiratory protection that's user-friendly and able to be implemented within healthcare settings. Current options, such as powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs, are difficult to implement and use in healthcare settings, especially because you can't like use a stethoscope when you're wearing one. They're also particularly challenging for pediatric settings because the equipment can be quite frightening to children. Next slide, please. During a pandemic involving an AMR and influenza, PPE is going to be critical to prevent spread within healthcare settings and also to protect against occupational exposures for staff. As I just mentioned, we can expect there are going to be shortages of PPE during this type of an event. Therefore, we need to have crisis protocols for optimizing available PPE, just as we had during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, there needs to be more investment in research to study the safety of these protocols. In studies, many healthcare personnel have reported they felt unsafe using those protocols. They did not believe there was adequate data about their safety before implementation. From research, what we've heard is that the most distrusted protocol was decontamination of respirators. There will also need to be an investment to provide dedicated time for IPs to train staff on those new protocols, observe practice to see if it's done correctly, and work with healthcare staff to ensure their comfort, safety, and support for the protocols. Next slide, please. IPs reported they had to drop many of their routine IPC duties, as I said before, and we can expect that to happen again during a future pandemic. What is most often dropped, as reported by the IPs, has been a focus on basic infection prevention and control or IPC protocols for preventing transmission of HAIs in healthcare settings. It's going to be critical that we have our qualified IPs involved in surveillance activities to collect and validate the data. It's also going to be important to focus on standard and transmission based precautions because healthcare staff are prone to making mistakes in practice when they're overworked, tired, and stressed out. And even minor mistakes can inadvertently lead to HAIs. Given that the scenario we're discussing involves a flu pandemic and secondary AMRs, there's also going to be a need to focus on prevention of healthcare associated pneumonias and ventilator associated events, such as ventilator associated pneumonias. APIC, SHEA, and CDC have published evidence-based protocols for prevention of these types of HAIs, such as focusing on preventing aspiration, aerodigestive tract colonization, and contaminated equipment. But we need to have qualified IPs that are familiar with those protocols that are able to lead those efforts in order to reduce HAIs. And as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, that didn't always happen. Next slide, please. It's also important to keep in mind that many AMRs can be spread through a contaminated environment. So it's going to be critical to ensure that environmental cleaning and disinfection practices remain thorough and that appropriate disinfectant products are available. Many healthcare facilities reported shortages in disinfectant products during COVID and on the fly, they had to try to vet new products from new vendors without knowing the effectiveness of those products. So we need to address this before the next event occurs. In healthcare settings, environmental services personnel are going to be critical to reducing the spread of AMRs, and we will need adequate numbers of trained IPs to conduct this training and ensure compliance with those protocols. As I mentioned before, and as Arjun stressed yesterday, a lot of these efforts require investment in human resources in the form of IPs and also public health professionals. I know I have focused a lot of my presentation on the healthcare setting, but AMRs can, or some AMRs can also spread in community settings. So it's gonna be really critical that public health has the infrastructure needed to help respond to this event. Next slide, please. Lastly, I wanted to briefly mention the need to invest in resilience training and support for IPs well-being. Studies conducted during the pandemic found that many IPs reported feeling burned out and or severely stressed. Their mental health suffered. In a study conducted with IPs, we asked them which strategies they believed should be implemented to support their well-being, and their answers are listed on this slide. Examples include providing resilience training, providing counseling or other types of emotional support, and financial incentives. All of these initiatives are going to require investment, but doing so would ensure that our IPs are willing and able to continue working through a pandemic involving an AMR 
while minimizing HAIs. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Raymond. So next, Dr. Tiffany Lee on preventing the spread, animal producer decisions and available resources. All right, are we on? Okay, very good. Okay, uh, again, Tiffany Lee, I am now Director of Animal Care and Compliance. Um, my role is a little bit different from um, the role that I was with previously when, when some of you all knew me. So uh, I appreciate you all um, welcoming me back. Um, so I am with Clemens Food Group at this point. Um, we are a pork production company. Uh, we have two slaughter facilities, one in Pennsylvania and one in Coldwater, Michigan. Um, and we have a number of farms um, managed by our Country View Family Farm System. Uh, I am a veterinarian. However, I am not one of our herd health veterinarians. Um, I am on our animal care team, which consists of the herd health veterinarians and my team, um, which is uh, animal care and compliance. So I just wanna make that stipulation right there. Uh, I will be involved in any decisions that are made in such a situation that's been described. Um, but I am not usually the one with boots on the ground unless, uh, of course, I'm needed, and there I will be. So, so to get started, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the biosecurity practices. Oh, sorry, next slide. I'm put, I have these on my computer, too. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the biosecurity practices that we have in place to prevent disease, um, whether that be, you know, a PERS outbreak or an influenza outbreak. So, some of the biggest things um, that we have in place that help prevent disease is downtime away from farms. And by that, I mean a person cannot physically enter a farm until they have had uh, one, two, three, four, even five days of downtime um, from whatever event or place that they had previously been. So for example, if I go to one of our slaughter facilities, I have to have four days of downtime um, until I can go to one of our farms again. That's very, very critical. Um, we do not want to drag in uh, disease, um, especially from our plants, because, you know, let's be real, we have lots of pigs coming into our plants. Um, we don't necessarily know the status of those pigs, except that they are healthy on animortem inspection. So, um, so that applies to both team members and to visitors. Um, international downtimes are usually five to seven days. Um, be, and that is mainly because of the foreign animal diseases um, that we could bring home uh, if, you know, we uh, were unlucky enough to do so. We also have other biosecurity practices in place. Um, we limit visitors to our farms. Uh, visitors have to fill out a questionnaire. They have to, we have to make sure that they have not been on other farms as well. Um, we also have geofencing, uh, which is really cool and fun. Um, we actually have an app that you can use um, and it alerts you when you enter a farm. Or if I go to the plant, it alerts you. And it will also alert you if you do not follow specific downtimes, uh, which is really helpful because I go to farms, I go to plants, I go to meetings. Um, very, very helpful to me. And that also sends an alert to our veterinarian, our herd health veterinarians, um, so that you know we know if somebody has breached biosecurity. Very, very helpful. Um, some of our biosecurity practices differ between sow, nursery, and finishing farms. Um, so we'll go through those a little bit. Um, and of course, our animal care um, and production teams will always, always determine any other measures that uh, we need to put in place, depending on whatever situation we're in, such as the situation that's been described in this scenario. So our sow farms, um, obviously pigs are born here. And so they, um, we, we probably have the most um, secure, biosecure facilities um, for our sow farms. Um, all gates, all doors are locked. Um, you can see a picture of, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. There we go. Um, all gates and doors are locked. You can see a picture um, of a sow farm there with a gate uh, locked up on top. Uh, we actually have a mechanism to report um, any kind of, of um, breaches in biosecurity. Um, we call that a, an OBR report. So if we, I go to a farm and a gate is not locked, I fill out a report, it goes to our animal care team. Um, we also uh, employ the Danish entry system. For some of the veterinarians, uh, you all would be familiar with, with this, um, but not a lot of people are, are familiar with how we create biosecure zones. So when you enter the farm, after you've gone through the gate and everything, um, 
you go into an ante room and you sit down on a bench and you take your shoes off. You kind of slide over um, and on the other side, you're just in, in your socks. Um, that way we don't track anything in on our shoes. Um, we have shower in, shower out facilities. All of our farm, our South farms are shower in, shower out. We have farm specific clothing. Um, we have clean, dirty lines where people know you cannot cross this line um, if you have showered in. Um, there is no outside access to the barns. Um, we obviously have pest control systems. Uh, we have fogging rooms for anything that comes into the farm. Anything um, that is um, inanimate basically goes through the, the fogging room. Um, and of course, we have specific biosecurity SOPs that everyone follows. Next slide. Very much the same at our nurseries because um, as someone on this council always says, um, when you mix young animals together, it's like um, you know sending kids to daycare. They bring home all the bugs. Um, now, good thing is um, in, in our particular system, we usually maintain the same flow. So everything from a cell farm goes to you know, the same nursery together or the same three nurseries together, um, but that's not necessarily the case throughout the industry. Um, so shower in, shower out, farm specific clothing, C and D lines, um, no outside access, um, et cetera. Next slide. So this is just, uh, these are some examples of the, um, the things that I go to farms and look at. So we go out, my team does bio, biosecurity verifications. We have a, a, a huge audit where we check and make sure everything is being followed. Um, and we do this at, for every farm at least once a year for South Farms, uh, it's usually four times a year. Um, you'll see our shower procedures, those all have to be posted. Um, I know it's kind of hard to see, but in that middle picture on the bottom, uh, there is a yellow clean dirty line that is in the shower room. Uh, we have farm specific coveralls that are all hanging up um, on the clean side of the shower. And then um, on the bottom there with the dark door, uh, that is an example of our fogging room. Next slide. So for finishers, um, it's, it's very similar except for the shower in, shower out procedure. Um, most finishing farms do not have the shower in, shower out. Some um, new ones may. Um, and, you know, in, in a situation that's, that's been described in this scenario, that may change depending on, you know, uh, how severe uh, these situations get. So we still have the clean, dirty lines. You still have farm specific clothing. You still have, a, have to have um, all the outside access. Um, you know, no outside access to the barns, pest control, and then there are other specific SOPs as well. Um, for example, when I get to a finishing farm, uh, I put on booties, like boot covers. When I get inside the finishing farm, I either change my boots or I put on other boots over those booties. Next slide. And so we get when we get into uh, the scenario that's been described here, um, I, it's very, very hard to say, exactly what our company or any other company, pig production company would do in this situation. However, um, you know, we have our, our individual veterinarians, our herd, herd health veterinarians that would al be, always be thinking of new and different ways to handle whatever situation they come, they come across. Um, they'll make choices based on their clinical observations and experience with the infectious agents. Treatments might depend on the bugs identified, and we've seen some of that in the scenario. Um, the susceptibility. Now, we're going to, you know, there's going to be, um, in a situation like this, there would be a huge demand on the diagnostic capabilities. We understand that. Um, but if we could get susceptibility profiles, we would most certainly use them just as we do in any practice today. Um, obviously, the effectiveness of any kind of treatment. Um, and like we've talked about quite a bit today with supply chain issues, the availability of any kind of treatments. Because right now, um, even in I don't, I don't know what we're calling peacetime post COVID. I, I don't know what we're calling it. Um, but you know, there are always, there is always, seems always there's some kind of drug that's on back order or, you know, we can't get, um, enough of what we'd like, um, whether that be just, you know, your dexamethasone or, or something else. Um, so, um, really we would rely on our herd health veterinarians to make those decisions along with our production team. And we do have some influenza vaccines available in a situation such as the one described. Perhaps you could look at some cross protection. Next slide. And as far as management on the farms, um, you know, the, the scenario described is, is very, um, well, I wouldn't say it's optimistic. 
Um, so it's, uh, you know, hard to describe exactly how you would handle such a situation, such an extensive situation. Um, but at Clemens Food Group, at Country View, our team members are always first. And we've seen this, you know, not just during COVID, it's literally all the time. The health and well-being of our team members is and always will be our focus. And we do have a number of trained team members, um, cross-trained team members that can and would step in if we needed to, um, you know, do anything to help maintain that pig welfare. And of course, pig welfare is a very, very close second um, to our team member welfare. Um, culling and depopulation decisions in a disease, um, a disease outbreak, they're not taken lightly at all. If animal welfare is compromised, we would always consider multiple options. Um, does that mean we schedule markets in a different way? Um, does that mean we do some um, very purposeful culling of a herd or multiple herds? Depopulation, um, we could probably talk about uh, the, the reasons why and how to go about it. We could talk about that all day. And I'm happy to talk about that, um, you know, when I don't have two minutes uh, to speak. Um, but the bottom line is with people or with pigs, we are never, ever, ever going to compromise our ethics, our integrity, and our stewardship. And that is why that is, you know, th those, that's our mantra for the Clemens Food Group. Next slide. And as I said, um, I do a lot of work at our slaughter facilities as well. And um, there, our team members always, always come first. Um, we have a number of trained team members um, that are cross-trained that can and, and will step in. We, um, you know, had uh, very, very good relation. We have very good relationship um, between the farms, our suppliers, and the plant. And that's always very, very, very helpful. And again, even at the plant, pig welfare is of utmost importance. This is, this is kind of my bread and butter. So I don't care what their end destination is. We treat them with respect. We will carefully consider um, our schedule of operations, always considering team member welfare and pig welfare. And we will always make careful consideration of the market movement schedules because that's very, very important when you're talking about getting 300 pound pigs um, to a facility. We have a crisis management team consisting of all departments. Um, and of course, in a scenario like this, they would have ongoing conversations. And again, we would never, ever, ever compromise our ethics, integrity, and, sh and stewardship. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that you can, can focus on here. I know it's kind of pie in the sky and everything, but that's what we do. And we would never compromise that for anything. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to take questions at, after our lovely speakers over here have talked. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, Jermon just suggested that I clarify and, and correct me, Dr. Lee, you talked about um, culling and depopulation. So in culling, I believe you were talking about targeted euthanasia of animals that might be showing clinical signs or something like that out of a population as opposed to a depopulation event like we would use on avian influenza where we would euthanize all of the animals in the group. Is that correct? Yes. Um, just to provide a little more clarity, culling would usually um, be more individual um, treatment. Depopulation can actually um, be individualized or, you know, whole herd, um, but essentially, yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so now our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Bender, uh, speaking on the agricultural workforce, human health risk, and roles of workers in preventing transmission. Dr. Bender. Well, thank you uh, for this invitation, uh, uh, giving a 10 minute talk with 10 slides an ac for an academic, this is gonna be a challenge. So, uh, but again, my, I'm a professor uh, in, uh, and the director for the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center or UMASH. Uh, it is one of 12 NIOSH funded uh, centers, National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health um, that focuses on the health and safety of the agricultural, forestry, and fishery workforce. And so I've been asked to talk briefly about infection prevention and control and biosecurity for the agricultural workforce in regards to the scenario that you provided. So next slide. <clears throat> and as an academic, I've taken the prerogative to present actually two case studies 
uh, a, some, from, from some fictitious uh, state in the United States. And as a reminder that the past can inform the future. So um, next slide. So this is the, the first uh, large uh, uh, avian influenza outbreak in Minnesota in a long time. So this is the uh, in 2015, an H5N2, um, where um, nearly uh, or 110 premises were affected. And so quite substantial and mostly affecting commercial turkey growers. The estimated cost was $650 million in lost uh, turkey and egg production. This is just Minnesota alone and nearly uh, 2,500 uh, jobs were actually directly affected or lost as a result of this pandemic. So in, in essence, this pandemic was dramatic and required a large and coordinated effort. Next slide. So one of our tasks, and I'm using the large we, or collective we uh, uh, that we have, uh, we were appointed by the governor's office to do an after action review. And so using a tool developed by the USDA as well as the University of Minnesota called OSMART, which stands for One Health uh, Systems Mapping Analysis Resource Toolkit. And we're supposed to use this to really do, to do an assessment. So I'll give you the positives. Uh, from this assessment, there are a number of positives, which included the ability to work together under stressful circumstances. Secondly, we were able to find solutions and improve systems. And thirdly, we um, had an existing positive working relationship before the outbreak that actually was instrumental for our response. However, we did identify some gaps in our response. So next slide. So these included uh, the ability to secure um, uh, and timely sharing of information, so that informational challenges, to be able to mobilize resources, especially between federal agencies and county emergency operations. We also had a lack of training, especially in incident command systems, ICS training. Um, also, and you're probably wondering, I'm supposed to be talking about the workforce here. Um, there were a number of issues that also came up um, that were important. One were the shared goals and consistent processes that we know some gaps in, and that include just how we label farms. Uh, so the federal premise ID issue. Another huge issue that I know this committee has not talked about is the issue of wildlife and wildlife surveillance and the tension uh, that existed between wildlife issues, especially avian influenza, which is very prominent, especially in 2022, uh, where we've seen a number of birds, especially wild birds that have been affected. So that's an important issue that needs to be addressed. And then lastly, uh, a lot of concern about worker and responder safety. And one of the things that I just want to um, highlight with that is that the workers often are uh, underserved communities, um, are often forgotten communities that don't have any uh, infrastructure support. And then also the responders are probably often forgotten. So uh, just a reminder that, you know, basically the worker and the response worker are often forgotten in the planning piece and need to be included. Next slide. So the next case scenario, um, I highlight uh, the work of a number of colleagues here uh, regarding a live an uh, animal market case study. And so um, next slide. Now, this is a very busy slide, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to go to the punchline a little bit here to highlight some of the issues. So this was a, an issue that uh, arose in our uh, uh, anonymous state uh, where we were seeing human cases uh, attributed to a live animal market. So in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota, we went out and did a number of samples, which included sampling um, pig lungs, uh, oral fluids. You probably wonder how do you get oral fluids out of a pig? You basically put a rope in their pen and pigs are very curious. So they suck on the rope. You then pick up the pet or the, the rope and then you test the rope. Uh, also, we did air sampling um, and also a number of environmental samplings, which included not only pig contact areas, but human contact areas. And this busy ch uh, uh, chart, uh, chart shows a couple things. One is notice the number of positives. So this is just sampling for, in a non-pandemic situation, um, 
influenza, and you can see that virtually um, in every one of our settings that we could find influenza. Also, that we were able to isolate the virus. So this is not just that we got a PCR signal, but we were able to detect and pull up the virus. And then also just the diversity of the viruses that we're seeing. So you can see that, especially in a live animal market, we're bringing a lot of animals together. And so in essence, there's a lot of virus that actually was circulating in this live animal setting. Next slide. And at the same time, we were collecting nasal swabs from the workers, from the people that were there on a daily basis. And um, this chart basically just shows uh, a distribution over time of what we found. And so part of, it, part of what we found is that there is a lot of seasonal influenza in people. So, you know, they weren't getting seasonal influenza from the pigs. This is actually what people were, were bringing in. But also you can see that there were some evidence of the workers actually having um, you know, influenza viruses. They weren't ill. None of these individuals were actually ill, uh, but basically we were detecting it, or at least one, or at least a, there was one seasonal one that actually had some illness, if I recall correctly. So again, um, the thing that I just want to remind you is that basically these viruses are moving back and forth. Also to remember, and one thing that are, is that pigs are often very receptive to picking up human influenza viruses. So it's important that our workforce recognize that they can bring in influenza viruses and, um, and share, share them with uh, their, their pigs. Next slide. So this gets down to the crux of what does this mean for the, the worker? And so uh, one is, is that influenza viruses are common uh, in swine and are regularly isolated, even from environmental samples that multiple influenza strains and subtypes were co-circulating. So in the pandemic or the scenario you're highlighting, I think that this highlights this issue and that interspecies transmission can readily occur. And so both of these case studies really highlight the importance of thinking about the worker, the responder, but also the family of the worker as well. Next slide. So this brings me to, to some questions. Um, to think about, you know, what uh, occupational uh, issues would you expect uh, in this regard? How do you protect the people that are exposed to these infected uh, swine, turkeys, or chickens? Also, what information do they need? How do, how do we, actually, this is what I've heard from the committee so far, is how do we communicate better? How do we be better communicators, especially for the varying audiences that we have? Um, what are the risks? Um, also, the other thing to think about is that not only are we worried about the influenza, but basically in the response teams, there's a number of issues that can be problematic. For example, the euthanasia um, agents, many of these are foaming agents. Some of these actually have carcinogenic properties. Um, the other thing is, is uh, the, the uh, heat stress and actually responding to, to these and also the appropriate uh, PPE and are they being used um, uh, well. And so then the other issue is, are the messages and the right messages getting it to the right people? The other thing that, um, for the sake of time, I, I actually eliminated a slide or two was the issue of environmental issues and concerns. How do we deal with the issues of mass uh, disposal? So the funeral pyres, you know, in the, in the old foot and mouth disease outbreaks in the UK, will they happen again, you know, in the US? Next slide. Likely needs. Um, one of the things that I, I observed, especially with our COVID response efforts, when we worked with farm workers, uh, is um, the, the, the delays and times in getting guidelines out. So we need to be better, better about getting quick development of guidance documents. So not perfect, but good uh, was, was an issue. And then also translating it into the appropriate levels, the appropriate languages, the appropriate cultural uh, um, uh, perspectives as well for many of those workers. Making sure that it's usable guidance for that workforce uh, is, is important as well. And then actually what we brought up, especially with the IP issue, is the um, importance of thinking about the emotional and psych psychological support for those workers, um, for the stresses and the response, especially in dealing with depopulation issues uh, are huge. And so that's just an important piece that we need to reemphasize. Um, my next slide is, is, is a summary slide, uh, which is a, uh, really a simplified version 
of a schematic reminding us of control measures. And so for, for those especially do environmental health issues, uh, hierarchy of controls, and this is a reminder for us to think about the importance of the prevention strategies and how often they are more effective and they should be our top priority. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll yield this, my time back to uh, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Bender, very helpful. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Lillian Abo, on the frontline perspective, healthcare workers and pandemic challenges. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm honored and humbled to be here um, in this panel and hope that I can bring um, the perspective from our front lines as a patient advocate, a leader, and a frontline healthcare worker. I am a professor of infectious diseases at the University of Miami and the associate CMO at Jackson Health System. So I oversee both infection control and antimicrobial stewardship in the safety net health system of Miami-Dade County. We have seven acute care hospitals, including behavioral health, uh, rehab. We have one of the largest solid organ transplant programs in the country and one of the level one trauma centers that trains the army. And we also oversee three of the Miami-Dade County jails that on any given day has 4,000 residents. Uh, we also have two nursing homes, five urgent care centers, and several clinics across the entire Miami-Dade County. So as you can imagine, I have a microcosm of diversity and healthcare disparities and opportunities that I hope bring to face what we challenge, what, what we face in this mock scenario. Next, please. Next slide, okay, perfect. So um, we were given the scenario of a pandemic caused by a highly transmissible respiratory virus and a multi-drug resistant bacteria and fungal pathogens, something we have never seen. Um, novel infections uh, like this, some of them have unclear mechanisms of transmission since they're novel. We don't know if this is droplet, is it airborne, is it contact, is it everything? What kind of PPE we need to deploy? Do you apply the same PPE in your private practice offices that you will apply in an urgent care or in an emergency room? Where are we going to test these patients? Where are we going to isolate these patients? And how are you going to treat them? What's the global supply chain interruption? And how are we going to get everything we need to provide care to everyone equally, regardless of their ability to pay? So some of the challenges we started facing in this situation, very similar to COVID-19, was the supply chain of PPE. We were very fortunate that our health system years ago prepared for Ebola, and we had a stockpile of PPE that was never used. But guess what? It was in a warehouse, and some of that PPE had expired. Some of it was already, we were not able to use. And my anesthesiologists are banging in the door, begging for papers. And we don't have a process for reprocessing papers in a pandemic. And we don't also don't have enough papers for everyone. So we started looking at where are N95s, and guess what? Some of them are disappearing from the Omni cells. Some of our Clorox and beach wipes and sandy wipes are also disappearing from the bedside areas. And now we have to figure out who's taking this out. And we don't want to blame any employees or family members. So we shut down visitors and we start giving clear plastic bags to every healthcare worker to protect them and to make sure that they can wipe out their clear bags, but we can also see what's in there. So nobody can bring anything from home that we cannot verify. We have to put our N95s in some secure areas, so our nurses had to figure out who to distribute them and how. And we had ample supply of PPE. We were very fortunate that we never had a shortage, but we really need to take control of the inventory because it was disappearing. Um, also, um, we started to cancel elective surgeries, but guess what? As a level one trauma center, as in a transplant center, you cannot cancel. When you need to save a life, you need to save a life. Same thing with labor and delivery. I cannot tell a mom, hey, wait another 10 months to deliver your baby. So um, those are some of the challenges that we started facing in a newborn ICU where you have no walls and you have mom has COVID and can she come and visit the newborn baby? Or do we put that baby at home with mom? And then the pediatrician is telling me that we're killing babies because mom is not able to breastfeed them. So we had to come up with very rapid innovations and figure out how to safely provide care for everyone at the same time, because all of these is happen concurrently, not like I have three months to plan each of them. Then on top of that, our antimicrobial stewardship program, which is like, we are like twin sisters with Dr. Spivak. Um, we have scarcity of antimicrobials. This is a multi-drug resistant pandemic now that we're facing in addition to antivirals. So now we have to figure out how to stretch our current inventory. Who do we restrict these drugs to? And we have very limited oral options to treat these multi-drug resistant bugs. So now I have to put more peak lines, more mid lines, and guess what? We have more clapsies. So, 
when next please when we look at the next um slide there are two things that when you're in the front lines you need to figure out one is operations and the other one is clinical so on the operation side is your people your products and your places where you're going to put everything and on the clinical side how do we triage who do we test how do we trace and how do we treat and then long and behold waiting for a vaccine and deploying a vaccine when traditionally vaccines are deployed in pharmacies and pediatrician offices or primary care, but no, we decide to deploy them in a hospital. So now I have to take all my resources from the bedside to start vaccinating people. This was not easy. We didn't have people coming in and saying, I wanna be a healthcare worker in the middle of a pandemic. It was actually the opposite. And the cost of labor went exponentially. I would say five to 10 times what we were paying before the pandemic. So now we have a stretch health system that is paying prime for a nurse because 10 nurses in our trauma ICU just resigned today because New Mexico is paying them $10,000 per day if they just fly today. So these are just some of my challenges. Next, please. So this is organizational chart. I am sorry that it's coming so small to you, but just to give you uh, the big picture, on the left side, we have our administrative health, health system leadership. And on the right side is myself as the chief of infection control, our director of infection control, the chief of emergency planning, and our corporate director of pharmacy. So we have to work on the clinical side and on the leadership operations side to mastermind this entire um, a group of people. And in a very agile way, from very early on this scenario, we have to put system leaders, all the CNOs, CEOs, all the C-suite on board. But most importantly, we really need to have open channels of communication. We needed to communicate internally with our providers because we always have, um, you know, chief gossip officers, and those are the ones you want to control very quickly. We don't want any gossip. We want to make sure that we have the facts, and we need to be very open and transparent when we don't know something. But at the same time, we had to balance that communication with global information that was coming and with what national guidelines and health officers are saying. So internal communication was key, communication to the public and communication through, you know, press and, and everything else that was being requested from all of us. How do we communicate with our patients and how do we communicate with their family members? So all of that had to be figured out very quickly. From an infection control, what are the protocols? Who do we allow to visit? How do we isolate? What are the PPE guidelines? Where are we going to distribute this PPE? From information and technology, we really were able to accomplish in a week what we were not able to accomplish in three years with IT. Dashboards were created immediately. We were able to start telemedicine when years before nobody knew how to turn on a camera. We needed to create apps and websites for um, employees to be able to check in their daily symptoms and be able to do contact tracing. And we were able to start distributing protocols that were changing literally every three hours. So other things we had to do is the same thing as Dr. Spivak, treatment protocols that all came under our stewardship team and pharmacy, but we also needed protocols for our ICU. How are we gonna manage ventilators? Who are we gonna give plasma exchange? What kind of drugs are we gonna use? Operating rooms. What's the threshold? How long can you wait for a surgery? Do we operate or not? And then of course your CFO is calling and saying, you're shutting down surgeries? How are we gonna see the revenues of the hospital? Patient care, um, again, we were also started clinical trials and our research office and IRBs and all those complexities that many of you have mentioned. Laboratory, this is my favorite. Laboratory and stewardship of testing when all the response is centralized to the health department or the CDC. And just very recently, we had monkeypox. And guess what? Same mistakes. So you have patients that are being referred to our ER. You have a highly infectious transmissible uh, pathogen. And I'm being told the only place I can test is in the ER. And then you have to call and spend four hours sending paperwork, pictures, uploading them to see if somebody centrally will give you approval to send your samples. And then I have to wait three days to three weeks to get my results because all of a sudden, everyone is inundated at the central level. So by the time commercial tests come out, it's a little late. And by the time we try to get our own in-house testing, it's like buying from Ikea. You have to get each one of your parts, figure out how to build it, and build your own homegrown test. So some opportunities there would be phenomenal for future uh, pandemic. And then, um, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about procurement, human resources. I think both veterinarians and humans, we agree that you need to take care of your people, and environmental controls. Additional challenges, next please. Additional challenges that are very unique to our site is we are by the port. So as we're in this mock scenario, I get a call 
similar to COVID-19, that we have a cruise ship that has 4,000 passengers, that there are some people with COVID, and we need space in the hospital. Well, I don't have 4,000 beds open. Um, I currently have a pandemic. So we had to deploy our emergency physician group to the port of Miami with a tent and start screening people to determine how many of them truly needed to be hospitalized versus not. And we talked to all the CMOs and CEOs of all the Miami-Dade County and Broward County hospitals to distribute equally the number of patients. So no single hospital will receive this surge of patients. This was a true collaboration with the health department, with the mayor, with the uh, governor, and um, with each of the hospitals that step up to assist because we didn't want to just dump the county with all the problems. Um, as you can see, we had to work also with our state officials and create testing clinics that were ramp up eventually and distribution sites because, again, if we're keeping our PPE, we really need to make sure that the residents and the trainees or medical students could go from different units and, and grab PPE in a central place. Next, please. So um, these are some of the dashboard inventories we had to create for pharmacy and make sure that we have a, a very close tracking of our critical levels, uh, not just antimicrobials and antifungals and antivirals, but every other critical drug that if you don't keep a dashboard and you don't track it, all of a sudden you only have two fentanyls left. And um, it's a problem when you have people intubated and paralyzed. Next, please. So some of the challenges that we have in the ICU, and I'm just gonna give you the very high level. This is highly contagious. Everybody's scared to go in. So EVS doesn't want to clean. Now we have a burnout nurse and PCT that also has to take out the trash. Nutritional services were leaving the food in the hallway. They didn't want to go in into the IC or any other area where there was COVID. Even if they had PPE, nobody had taken the time to teach EVS the donning and doffing of the PPE because uh, everybody was focused on the frontline uh, you know, providers. And then the nurses have the bright idea because they start seeing on the internet that you can put longer tubing and have the pumps outside so you don't have to go as frequently in the room. That's great to protect the healthcare worker, but all that tubing was going on the floor. And all of a sudden we have an outbreak of candida auris. Well, guess what? We need to start sending our candida auris test out, but the central lab is in Jacksonville, is overwhelmed, so they start sending to Minnesota. But there is a snowstorm, so now our testing is delayed two weeks. Next, please. We also started looking at our PPE burn rates and how can we preserve our N95s and the University of Nebraska, again, a lot of sharing information comes with our recipe, they publish it and we start adopting it with our UV light. But then after two weeks of running this amazing operation, our uh, COO calls and says, you know what, we need the UV light to clean the rooms. And the same staff that is actually, you know, cleaning the N95s is the staff that I need to deploy to clean the rooms. I don't have extra staff and I don't have extra UV lights. And each one of these UV lights can cost a quarter of a million dollars. So I don't have extra money to buy you 10 new UV light machines to clean the rooms. What do you want? N95s or cleaning the rooms? So I think that decision is pretty straightforward. Uh, next, uh, our ER and operating room um, faculty is also getting very dizzy with the N95 operating for six and eight hours. So they want additional masks that are not approved by OSHA. And we have to come up with some protocols for emergency utilization. And then, uh, again, isolation and placement, same of the challenges that I more or less have described. When you have a situation like this, you don't have enough rooms. The nursing homes and other long-term places don't want to take candida auris. They don't want to take patients with MDRO. Now my length of stay increases, and I have two pandemics, this MDRO and the influenza. I don't have rooms to discharge these patients. Some of them cannot go home. And then I need to, I still have people flooding through my emergency department. So placement, initially the hotels open. But then when that was gone, it was very challenging. Next, please. So again, just to highlight uh, the jails, behavioral health, and uh, these are just some of the unique populations that you really need to think through. Uh, when I am arresting new people, my CEO told me, oh, but people uh, with COVID don't come from Italy. They're not going to go to jail. Our first scales in the jail was someone arrested by immigration that had just arrived from offshore. So when you're dealing with a global problem, it can hit you anywhere. It's not going to come in your front door with a label. Um, and behavioral health, the same challenge. Very hard to keep people with masks and cleaning standards when people are sharing rooms. Next, please. So um, again, I'm, I'm gonna skip this one because I have only 50 seconds. Uh, so I think I have lighted some of our challenges, uh, but I also wanna move to the next slide, which is really some of the opportunities and, and my key messages. This pandemic was very, very near and dear to my heart. And this resembles very much COVID-19 because it's very easy when we're all here in a room planning the next crisis, when it's 
patient X or John Doe. But when it becomes your ICU nurse, Sally, who's right there in the bottom, who died from COVID early in our pandemic, when you see one of your obstetricians in your community hospital, in your ICU, and there's nothing you can do, or when you have your own uncle, and that's my uncle and my first mentor. My uncle developed the specialty of rheumatology in Caracas, Venezuela, and he was a world-renowned specialist. And it was heartbreaking to me to have him in the ICU with no visitors. I was the only family at bedside. The nurses were scared to death to go into the room, and he asked to be DNR and DNI. And I was begging everyone to give them steroids, and they were telling me that I was not based on evidence. It's very easy for me to say things are not based on evidence, but when we have a crisis, we have to be nimble. And when it's your loved one, you are going to do whatever it takes to save their life. So I, I do ask you that whatever actions we take today and recommendations, make them as it was your loved one in this bed, in this mock scenario, because these are the things that we all had to face. And that, to me, happened on April 1st, 2020, and changed my life completely throughout the entire pandemic. Next, please. So for global problems, we need global solutions. And I think we can't use the same tools to solve the problems that we use the tools to create them. So I do beg everyone here to think of timely and cost-effective global solutions. When something works elsewhere, how can we bring it to the U.S. so we don't have to replicate 20 clinical trials here? How can we have global collaborations that are safe and that have value and don't add additional cost to our expenditures in, in our GDP? Communication, communication with the front line and seek our input. When the CDC says stop wearing masks, how does that apply to healthcare workers? Um, decentralization of rapid testing. When we have a disease and like these multidrug resistant pathogens, in Europe we have carbapenemase point of care tests. Why don't we have those in the US? This would be very helpful. Lateral flow assays where we can do rapid detection. Allocation of resources and technology. I think we need to be early adopters of technology. And right now, I, we can talk about artificial intelligence, digital twins, metaverse. How can we leverage that to educate the public, educate healthcare workers in real time, and do in silico trials where you don't need so much paperwork and you can do everything in a virtual world to expedite the adoption of innovations? And then last but not least, it's really understand that we need to take care of the frontline workers and we also need to think globally. We are not in an isolated bubble anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alvo, for a very real presentation. And uh, thank you for still doing what you're doing, because clearly it wore me out just watching it. <laughs> and for your loss during that period of time. Thank you. We'll now move to our last speaker, um, Dr. Arjun Suravasan, on infection prevention and control during a pandemic outbreak. Fantastic. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So, you know, I think that the the potential for an AMR pandemic with a novel influenza pandemic is not just probable, it's inevitable, right? So we, we saw this during COVID. We had an AMR pandemic during COVID. Uh, we've published on that, presented on that. We saw significant rises in every single AR pathogen that we track. All the pathogens on the threat report in healthcare they all went up during the pandemic, wiping out hard fought gains that had been accrued over many years, right? So this is the reality of the scenario that we're dealing with. Next slide. And like COVID, any future pandemic is gonna pose threats to AMR on both the, the patient side and on the prevention side, right? This is the reality, you're going to have sicker patients, you have longer lengths of stay, you have more patients, you have more device use, and you have many more transfers between acute care and long-term care settings. All of those are realities on the patient side. And at the same time, you have even more challenges with respect to the development of antimicrobial resistance. You have limitations in your ability to address those challenges. As you've heard from, uh, from Lillian, you have shortages of personal protective equipment, of disinfectants. You have staffing shortages. So you have this perfect storm, which led to an AMR increase during COVID and would obviously lead to increases in AMR during any other pandemic. Next slide, please. I, you've heard time and again, the best approach to combating uh, any resistant pathogen or any emerging pathogen is to stop it before it develops a foothold. 
I applaud Pat Carb for including this session. I think you have saved the best for last. There is no question that infection prevention and control is going to be the most important first line of defense in any pandemic, both for combating the viral pandemic pathogen and combating the AMR threats that will come along with that. Uh, this was the, the mantra that we had during COVID, especially in nursing homes, keep it out, detect it fast, stop the spread. That is the initial way that you are going to have success against any emerging pathogen. Next slide. I would argue that we are in a fundamentally better place with respect to the infection prevention and control infrastructure in this country than we were at the start of the pandemic. And I think we've made gains on two fronts. The first is with the expansion of some of the infection control capacities that we have in this country. For years before, or a decade before the start of the pandemic, CDC has been funding state programs focused on preventing, helping facilities prevent healthcare associated infections and address and combat antibiotic resistance. These programs were expanded during the pandemic and they were an incredible support to healthcare facilities around the country. Our state-based HAIAR programs did over 58,000 consultations helping healthcare facilities that were experiencing COVID outbreaks. They did more than 20,000 infection control assessments to help healthcare facilities get ready to manage COVID outbreaks. Um, most of these were done in nursing homes, right? So they were able to bring critical infection control and prevention infrastructure to settings where that infrastructure is severely lacking. Next slide. We were also able to expand our ability to get data for action. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, the National Health Healthcare Safety Network has been in place for many, many years before the pandemic, but there were resources that allowed us to expand this infrastructure and capacity, right? So within uh, months, weeks of the pandemic coming, uh, arriving, we brought online COVID reporting modules in NHSN for all types of healthcare settings. And these were particularly used in long-term care facilities where CMS mandated reporting into NHSN. This was data for action, not data for counting. Every week, data from NHSN went to the supply chain control tower in HHS. Personal protective equipment supplies were sent to nursing homes that indicated they had shortages. Health departments use this information on a weekly basis to identify nursing homes that were experiencing outbreaks. Our CMS quality improvement organizations have used and continue to use this information on vaccine uptake to identify nursing homes that have low rates of vaccination to get into those facilities and work with them. And of course, investigators from the government and from other places have used the data in NHSN to assess the effectiveness of the infection control recommendations and to assess the effectiveness of the vaccines and therapeutics. Next slide, please. We have also created new infrastructure. So in addition to expanding what existed previously, we now have some new resources available to us. As you just heard from Lillian, one of the big problems during the pandemic is Healthcare personnel needed additional training, your environmental services staff, your food services staff, who all of a sudden needed training, just-in-time training on personal protective equipment. What we heard from our colleagues on the front lines is that you know, our infection prevention staff, we don't have time to do all of this training. We can't come offline from all of the things that we're doing. We need training resources. So CDC launched Project First Line, which is an effort to provide tailored training just-in-time training to every healthcare provider in America. And this is training that's being developed with a, a, through the lens of adult learning and also with health equity in mind. So this is a, a new program, new infrastructure that exists, was created uh, through the funding that was received during the pandemic. Next slide. Despite all of that, we know that gaps continue to exist. Uh, you've heard this many, many times. Sustainability is a huge gap. All that infrastructure that I just described was expanded or built with supplemental COVID funding. When that funding goes away, that infrastructure decays along with it. You've heard this also time and time again, staffing shortages in literally every staffing category that you can name, right? This is a massive problem. This is not a new problem in healthcare. There were staffing challenges 
Go look at the long-term care literature. They have been in staffing crisis mode for years before there was ever a pandemic. The pandemic only exacerbated all of those existing challenges. This is going to require, I think, incredibly broad and novel solutions. I don't think we have the answers, but I can certainly tell you, as I've heard from many healthcare, uh, healthcare workers, uh, more muffins and pizza parties are not the answer to the morale problems that we face in healthcare. Next slide, please. We also know that in addition to addressing those gaps, we need to think about innovations in the infection prevention and control space. We need new approaches and strategies so that we can really bolster our infection prevention and control infrastructure so that we are ready at the very early stage to combat a novel pandemic, uh, AMR threats at the first initiation to prevent them from developing that foothold. Next slide, please. I'll talk about a few of those. The first is vaccines. Right, and vaccines, I think, here have a dual purpose and a dual role. First is we need to invest in innovations for vaccines against the AR pathogens themselves. We have seen the success of strep pneumo vaccines in reducing rates of antibiotic resistance in strep pneumo, but we don't have vaccines for very many of our AR threats, and we don't have vaccines for any of the healthcare AR threats. We need E. coli vaccines, a C. diff vaccine, MRSA vaccines, those types of AR-directed pathogen vaccines will be an enormous innovation and a step forward. As Dr. Blazer mentioned yesterday, we also need innovations in increasing the acceptance of our other types of vaccines, like the flu vaccine, the COVID vaccine. We know that when people get vaccinated against those viral respiratory pathogens, it helps decrease antibiotic prescriptions, which helps then reduce the selective pressure for more antibiotic resistance. Next slide, please. We can also invest in innovations in decolonizing agents. And I think this is a big area of focus. It's a big area of focus for us. And I think we need more innovations in this space. Can we selectively decolonize, remove these AR pathogens from especially the GI tract of patients? I think there is promise that's been shown here, which uh, and these decolonizing agents could potential have, potentially have multiple beneficial effects. First of all, they would decrease the risk of infection for any individual person, and we have seen that. That's been demonstrated in studies. It also helps restore the healthy microbiome so that you would get uh, better uh, long-term protective effects of that healthy microbiome. In addition to the direct benefits to the patient who gets the decolonizing agents, uh, as you can see on this slide, those decolonizing agents have an even greater multiplying effect because they reduce the transmission of those pathogens. So for every person that you're able to decolonize, you can potentially prevent multiple infections because you can prevent transmission. This is an incredibly powerful strategy that we need to focus on and develop. Next slide, please. We also need better device technologies. As most of you know, all of our infection control procedures for all of the devices that we use depend exclusively on healthcare providers' behavior. They depend on healthcare providers being able to do the right thing, the right practice every single time. Those have worked pretty well. We have had success in reducing device-associated infections. But guess what happens when healthcare providers, as Lillian just described, what happens when people become extremely busy, when staffing gets short and you don't have time to adhere to those practices, you see reverses in device safety. And that is exactly what we saw during the COVID pandemic. We've wiped out five years of progress in central line associated bloodstream infection prevention. What we need here is better devices. We need innovations, devices that are easier to maintain, easier to, to clean, uh, and we need devices that are more resistant to being uh, contaminated with microbes in the first place. Next slide, please. And finally, we need innovations in the healthcare delivery space. I mean, a great example here, again, as Lillian described, was the expansion of telemedicine. Uh, what an incredibly powerful strategy to reduce infection risks, but even more importantly, to bring healthcare, to bring care to people who needed it. It was a way to address potential disparities, to increase health equity. We have to think about strategies, what we can expand with telemedicine, and what are other novel healthcare delivery strategies that we can bring to bear that would uh, support infection prevention and control practices, and at the same time, reduce health disparities. We need innovations in that space as well. Next slide, please. 
What's needed, I think you know what I'm going to tell you what's needed, right? As we discussed yesterday, it doesn't matter what your question is. The answer is always money. Sustainability. As I mentioned, all of these things that were expanded and built during the pandemic, they go away if we don't have sustained funding for them. All of the PPE infrastructure that's been built uh, and, and grown, we have to sustain that funding. And these innovations will take investments as well. We can't have innovations without all of the research that's going to underlie those. So we're going to need to support uh, investments in all of these different areas to make these gains and keep these gains that we have in infection prevention and control. Thank you. All right. Thank you for a very uh, informative panel uh, and uh, appreciate all the input you've provided. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.